Hey guys, Woodruff here. So now let's talk about different complications you can have from a fracture. The first one is going to be compartment syndrome. So if you want to learn more about the compartments in your um, muscles, you can watch this osmosis video. Um, great, uh, great, great video. It, I think this is just a preview too. It's one of those like where it doesn't show you the whole video. Um, but it gives you some good, if you don't really understand what I mean by a compartment, I'm going to explain the best that I can um, in my verbal explanation. I think I came up with a cool analogy, so we'll see here. But um, effectively in your muscles, and if like, if you look in this picture, see how there's like these different like, um, like separations here, there's, there's actually apparently per your textbook, 38 compartments in your upper and lower extremity. So different, um, I, I, the analogy that I created, and you can take it or you can leave it. Is, is that it's effectively like a junk junk drawer. So think of like a drawer in your house where you throw all your extra stuff. Imagine that it gets overfilled and you can't fit anything else left in it. And it has a finite or a only a certain amount of space that you can stuff or put stuff in it. Um, it can't stretch and get any bigger. So then it, what it does is when you're trying to put stuff in, it's actually putting pressure down into the stuff that's already in the drawer. And that's what happens too with compartment syndrome is that what happens is when you have an injury, like you have a fracture, um, inflammation happens. So there's already swelling. Um, a lot of times there can be decreased venous return, which leads to more fluid being in the area, which adds more pressure. But again, just think of all the stuff that's um, happening. And it's a mix of um, we put casts splints, other devices, restrictive dressings on these patients to, um, you know, immobilize their fractures, which we need to do. Um, but that limits or kind of think of it, it closes that drawer, it makes that drawer more finite. Like um, usually, even if people have these compartments, you know, they usually have room to stretch. But if there's a cast on the outside of that leg, it loses the ability to have stretch or expansion. Um, so that's part of the problem. But the other problem is, is that there's more stuff going in my drawer. So part of the problem is my drawer can't stretch um, because I've limited the space because I have casts, splints, dressings on it. But the other problem is, is that there's been bleeding there's been inflammation, there's swelling going on. And what happens then again is that it pushes inward. So if you look at this picture, like in these compartments, what's on the inside around all this muscle tissue where all this stuff is collecting is your blood vessels. And um, what happens when there's too much pressure and it's pushing inward is that it actually leads to, um, you know, pressure on the arteries, which can lead to complete tissue and like you know cell and think peripheral or away from the injury um cell death like our um you know uh, i don't want to say organ um but tissue i think i'm gonna just stick with tissue tissue death so think of this as like the same thing as like having severe pad to the point where like there's a blockage of the arteries and flow can't get to the feet it's the same thing here it's just a different reason that pretty much just think that there's swelling and extra expansion in the compartments within the um, muscle tissue in the legs or the, the legs an example here can happen in the arms too. Um, it can actually happen anywhere you have compartments in your abdomen and blah, blah, blah too. But just keep in mind, let's just stick with the legs for now because it's simple. So you have all this stuff that's building up in the legs, swelling, edema, all these extra particles. Then you have this limited ability to stretch or expand because you put constrictive stuff around on the outside to, to, you know, to help with the mobilization. And as a result, all that it has, uh, the only place it can go is inward and then it puts more pressure on this blood vessel. There's decreased flow to my peripheral extremities and the tissue starts to to die. Um, so this is a perfusion problem. Um, so um, let me see if I could make it work. Fat embolism. I think this is the fat embolism syndrome doesn't have anything about P in it. Yeah. If I'm saying it right, embolism, I'm just making sure that I'm not forgetting. Okay. Yeah. Um, so this compartment think um, the P in compartment is a perfusion issues. Um, uh, and so uh, a perfusion issue, excuse me. And so um, this is really a, this is a life or death um, emergency um, if a patient gets this because they can end up having a, um, needing an amputation or need, um, losing their limb because of decreased blood flow. Just kind of like just everything we learned about amputation, the decreased flow, this is a similar issue, just obviously for a different reason. Um, it's most common in people that have long bone injuries, like people that have femur fractures, when I say long bone, I'm talking about the femur usually. Um, and then those that have had extensive, like major crush injuries or extensive damage, um, cause there's going to be more of those particles, um, more inflammation and stuff in those compartments, um, leading to worsened blood flow. 
So what are my assessment findings? What am I going to expect? So the, the big things that we're going to do for compartment syndrome is a neurovascular assessment. And this is going to look like how many is this? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven of them. Um, but I mean, there's obviously more here you could add in capillary refill. But the P's of compartment syndrome, these are the abnormalities that you're going to find. Um, they're going to have pain out of proportion. So in other words, like, you know, it's normal to hurt after a fracture, but if their pain is just never ending, relent, relentless, getting worse, um, or it was, it was managed with meds. Now all of a sudden it's not like those should be like ding, 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 warning signs. Like that's not normal pain on passive stretch. So what this means is, is that like, let's say that I broke my arm here. Like normally if I broke my arm and you flex my fingers back, it's not going to hurt. But if I'm starting to have pressure and tension, build up here, extra stretch. If you start bending my fingers, it, it's going to lead to severe pain. So, um, I, you know, working at the hospital that I work at, um, sometimes what they, um, the orthopedic doctors, when they're kind of worried about compartment syndrome in a patient, they'll come around and say, hey, I'm going to come around and do a compartment check. And they'll come by every couple hours and they'll perform a passive stretch on a patient or see if they can move the joints around where the injury is and make sure that there's no pain on that passive stretch. Um, <clears throat> and so then we also want to look for swelling or edema or increased pressure in the compartment. Um, and this is what I talked about in the first video, the neurovascular video, where I said, like, one of the first things to look for this that I ask about is just like, hey, how is your device feeling? Like, let's say they have a cast or a splint on. If it's suddenly feeling tight or the patient, was they were okay. And all of a sudden they're like, man, this cast is tight or something's not like they can, they'll start to feel it. It's going to, because again, like what's happening is, is that their compartment is trying to expand and it's, it's hitting that brick wall of that cast or that other device. Um, so um, they're usually having, you see a lot of swelling. Um, or if they have a device on, they're going to complain about it feeling tight. Um, paresthesia is numbness, tingling. So think of this as the same thing we always talked about. Um, if you cross your legs too hard or if like, you know, there's a lot of pressure on something like you fall asleep on your hand and then it starts to feel those pins and needles. Um, it's because there's decreased flow. All of these are signs of poor flow to my extremity. We're going to look at color. Um, I guess the one that's not on here is the poikilothermia. Uh, uh, um, color and um, temperature. So pallor and poikilothermia. Um, so cool, um, you know, pale uh, extremity. And then um, paralysis, they may be unable to move it. That's not going to be an early sign. We'll talk about early versus light here in a minute. Um, and then loss of pulse. They might have a decreased pulse. Um, hopefully, hopefully they still have a pulse. Um, and when I say pulse, I don't mean like carotid, like they're, they're dead. Um, but what I mean is, is like a pulse to their extremity. Like so this would be if it was a leg issue, the dorsalis pedis posterior tibial. Um, and if this was an arm issue, a radial pulse, um, we could also check capillary refill and it could be diminished, decreased, or it should be um, greater than three seconds if it's abnormal. All right, let's do an application question. A nurse is caring for a client with a right tibial fracture in a fiberglass cast, an intraction, which we haven't learned about yet, but we'll learn about soon. Based on the chart data below, which of the states means is most accurate? So at 0700, assessment was completed. Client is in 10 out of 10 pain, experiencing numbness and tingling to the right leg. They received morphine at 630. So 30 minutes before that, they received morphine. So within, you know, most IV medication works within 15 to 20 minutes at most 30 minutes. Um, if they um, received pain medicine 30 minutes ago, and they're still in 10 out of 10 pain, they've had no improvement. I'm kind of concerned. Place the leg um, the client, sorry, placed the client in a supine position and elevated the leg and applied ice. So it sounds like they were having pain. So the nurse was trying other pain alternatives since the medication wasn't working. So here's my statements. Let's see which one is most accurate, <coughs> which can mean all of these are semi-accurate. Maybe they're not, but it could be that all of them are accurate, but what's the most accurate? So A is the nurse completed the correct actions to decrease pain and improve blood flow. Well, I don't know if she completed the best actions because what I'm thinking about is is if someone's um showing signs uh, they're having a lot of pain and they're having signs of poor perfusion the numbness and tingling to the right leg um that that could be a sign of compartment syndrome and if they elevate the leg it's going to make it that much worse and if they apply ice it's going to make it worse too because it causes vasoconstriction so I don't think they did the right thing um, the nurse should have retrieved additional pain medicine first. Well, the patient is in 10 out of 10 pain, but they're also showing like signs of like an ABC issue, the C for circulation. So um, while pain is a priority and I want to get their pain under control, they're having pain, what it looks like based on this information, this question, they're having pain because they don't have flow and no amount of pain medicine is going to fix their blood flow issues. 
um, if they have if they're having compartment syndrome. The nurse should not have elevated the leg or applied ice as it further decreases blood flow. Well, that's kind of like what I said earlier. So this is the one I like so far. Um, so you kind of also see a test taking strategy here is A and C are, are actually opposites. Um, and so a lot of times when there's opposites, one of them is going to be correct. So sometimes it's testing to see which one, if you know which one is correct. So I'm thinking it might be C, but let's look at D. The nurse should have cut open the client's cast and remove the traction. So that does seem like, hey, you know, we talked about what's going to actually help this patient um, to... Um, uh, what do you call it, um, to restore perfusion. And if the cast is limiting, if they're really in compartment syndrome and the cast is limiting their ability, traction is going to make compartment syndrome worse. They sound like logistical things, but I think I need to call the doctor first. I think I have a doctor, have to have a doctor's order. I can't just, um, you know, go all MacGyver here and, um, you know, just start like ripping things off. Like they say, I'm hurting and I'm having these, these paresthesias. And I'm like, cut the cast, remove the traction. Like, you know, I need to touch base with the doctor first. So I think the most appropriate thing is going to be C. And I'm correct. So uh, sorry, you know, if, if you're not a gory person, you can just cover your eyes like this. Um, and so um, priority interventions for compartment syndrome are going to be um, getting an early diagnosis um, because the sooner that we can, this is a perfusion issue. And within a few hours, the tissue in, um, can die and because um, because of, of the swelling, the extreme um, perfusion issues. So we want to uh, notify the physician as soon as possible. So what are we going to look for specifically? So like I mentioned, look for a pain that does not get better with medications or out of proportion to injury. That is one early sign. Pain out of proportion to injury, that's not getting better. The second early sign are going to be paresthesia. So look for the numbness, the tingling. It's, it's the body's way of trying to tell you, hey, there's not flow coming here. It's earlier sign. Whereas the late sign is going to be if they don't have a pulse or they can't move it. Like if we're at the point, again, we kind of talked about this with the seven P's and one C thing that, um, uh, the loss of pulse, um, you know, if we're at the point where we have no pulse, if we're at the point where we can't move it, that's like an extreme lack of blood flow. So what do I do? So my priority actions are to call the doctor first, because I. Um, this is one of those times like, you know, where um, any of the actions that I'm going to take um, are not going to stop the patient um, from having this issue. Like there's nothing I can do as a nurse to fix this, um, the doctor needs to come in and maybe perform an emergent fasciotomy. So um, I need to call them first. Now, the only time the answer would be to do other actions if I haven't done a complete assessment. So for example, um, if the question or the thing back there talked about, um, hey, the patient's in 10 out of 10 pain, their pain has not been relieved. Um, you know, if that was the only thing I had, the best answer there would have been like, hey, perform a full neurovascular assessment. I do want to call it like, if I just call the doctor and say, hey, the patient's still hurting. Well, are they still hurting and they're showing signs of blood flow issues? Or are they just hurting? Because um, if they're just hurting, but they're in their pain's not relieved, it's not that it's not an issue, but it's a different type of issue. If they have beautiful perfusion, but they, they just need more pain medicine, that's one thing. But if they're having pain issues and showing signs of decreased blood flow to their extremities, that's super serious. So I do want to make sure I have a neurovascular assessment um, done before calling the doctor. Um, usually, I, I like on other people for your exams, I don't want to steer you wrong. Um, but I can just speak for our exams. Like, you know, usually, if you have that, um, the neurovascular assessment done, we want to call the doctor as early as possible um, to get an intervention. Now, they may order for us to remove the pressure, like by removing cast and dressings, they may, may, they may order us, or I should say prescribe us to remove or reduce the traction weight. Um, but we absolutely do not want to elevate it. We do not want to apply ice. And so a lot of people get confused by the elevation. They're like, elevation is good. It's going to um, decrease that edema. And normally you're absolutely right. But here's why it doesn't work in compartment syndrome. In compartment syndrome, I'm already super swollen um, to the point where um, I'm putting extra pressure on my blood vessels. If I elevate that extremity, um, it's actually like right now I'm already not getting flow to my foot. If I elevate it, that's creating additional gravity that blood flow has to overcome. So if I already have barely none or like barely any blood flow, it's going to make it that much worse. And um, we also don't want to apply ice, like I mentioned, because the vasoconstriction. 
I'm going to monitor their urine output closely for that rhabdomyolysis, which can eat, lead to kidney issues, like I talked about with the dialysis and stuff like that. So um, really watching closely because this um, this can like once all that stuff in the compartment um, starts to get released and is going to the kidneys, the kidneys can get overwhelmed. So watch kidney function closely. And then the doctor is going to perform what's in this picture, which is what's called an emergency fasciotomy or surgical fasciotomy. And um, what that is, is effectively like, hey, what's the issue here? There's no room for stretch. We're going to take all the things out of the way so that the uh, muscle can stretch and they're literally cutting it open again this is a Gray's Anatomy thing there was that guy that was the runner that took aspirin um, and it led him to get compartment syndrome and I'm not saying don't be a runner and take aspirin um, this is no medical advice here this is just a tv show but just to help get some context if you were a Gray's Anatomy fan um, but they had to do the same thing where they had to sit there and they had to do the double fasciotomies to the guy's legs um but effectively, we're creating space. We do the same thing when there's increased pressure in the brain, um, where they literally cut out a part of the skull to leave um, space for the brain to expand. Um, and then, um, you know, in severe cases, if we did not get to it in time, they may need an amputation. Okay, that's it for compartment syndrome. Hopefully it didn't sound too depressing. Um, it really is something, it's not incredibly common, but it does happen. Um, so it's just... in really instilling that importance of that peripheral neurovascular assessment after this, really monitoring, um, you know, the area around the fracture, monitoring the fracture site to make sure that there's space um, for, because the, really the body's trying to recover. It just needs the space to recover. So um, yeah. And then just remember your priority interventions to support good blood flow until the doctor can come and save the day. Anyway, I'll see you next for fat embolism syndrome.